It's My Nerd World, a Depeche Mode show. On this week's episode, I watched The Last Jedi this past week. I've watched it a bunch of times, but it's been a while. I want to share some thoughts. What's interesting is that the thoughts that I wanted to share are going to relate directly to some of the news items that I found for this week's episode. I wish we had more Star Wars storytelling content to talk about, but things are rather quiet as we await the arrival of the Bad Batch later on this month. What I do have to share are some interesting recent comments from Daisy Ridley, Ray, Ewan McGregor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, talking separately about the pressures and the anxiety of creating Star Wars. Let's get to this week's show. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. Calling to you. My nerd road. Just let it in. Welcome to it. A Star Wars show. I'm your host, John Justice, talking about a galaxy far, far away once again. If you want to email me, talk show nerd at gmail.com. Of course, you can leave a comment on YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you happen to be listening to it. And if you read science fiction, head on out and pick up your copy of Embark, my science fiction space opera series, an exciting mix of Star Wars, Fast and the Furious, Ready Player One, the science fiction adventures of the 70s through the 2000s, seven books in all in the series available on Amazon.com uh, or MyNerdWorld.net as Earth faces its end. Follow pilots Taft, Katha, and their crew on a journey of survival across the galaxy as they fight for humanity's future. I'll talk a little bit more about this coming up uh, later on in the episode. And I wish we had some story content to get into. We're kind of past the most recent storytelling of Ahsoka that continues to get a rewatch from me and an eye roll from my family whenever they come down and catch me watching it once again. But I do just adore that series. I had been doing a rewatch of the sequel trilogy. I watched The Force Awakens a few weeks back. And uh, over the course of this past week, I sat down and watched in one sitting, which doesn't happen very often, by the way, of The Last Jedi. Again, a film that I hadn't watched in, in a while, and it was... Um, typical of when I get some distance on any of these newer Star Wars um, productions, and that is it, it becomes fresh. Um, you, you pull different things from it regardless of how many times you've watched it, and being able to sit down and watch the entirety, because it's a long movie, of The Last Jedi in, uh, Last Jedi in one sitting was uh, certainly an enjoyable experience. And I was reminded once again of the artistry and the care and the craft that goes into making these films. The Last Jedi is not without its controversies. Not even arguably the most controversial Star Wars movie ever ever made, and I understand why. I do find it interesting that so much of the complaints about the film, in my opinion, fall flat when you compare... Those complaints to content that we got in the original trilogy, which I recently did a rewatch of, um, the goofiness of, of certain aspects of the characters and the and the dialogue. Um, now, this is before I get into the way in which Luke Skywalker was portrayed and Ryan Johnson's desire to subvert expectations. Um, both aspects of which I enjoyed. I enjoyed it when I first saw the film, and I enjoyed it just as much as I. Um, did this last time watching the film. I've always said that I had my time with the original characters in the original trilogy. I didn't need the new set of films to highlight any of those characters. I'm glad that they were there, but 
I preferred seeing Luke Skywalker this way because life doesn't always go the way that you expect, even though it's contrary to what so many fans would have expected and thought how Luke Skywalker should be portrayed in his later years. I just really enjoyed that movie from beginning to end. Um, it is it is as much a part of that trilogy as it is in and of itself its own film. Um, you could arguably say this about all three of the movies. Um, the Last Jedi, though, to me, is the one film where if you just want to go in and just watch a Star Wars movie and get a complete tale uh, that it's kind of easy to follow and make sense on its own it's the last jedi and i feel like that was ryan johnson's intention and maybe this is what tripped up the sequel trilogy among so many fans this idea that there wasn't a plan but ryan johnson seemed to go and say i have a vision i'm going to tell this story that's an extension of the force awakens but i'm absolutely going to do my own thing i feel like it works well within the three films as I've said many times on the show, um, The Last Jedi, um, as it flows into The Rise of Skywalker, the two films complement each other very well. I don't think it was J.J. Abrams' intention to look at what he did in The Force Awakens, look at what Ryan Johnson did in The Last Jedi, and then do kind of an amalgam of the two. But I really do feel that is the case, especially um, in the visual storytelling of... Um, the Rise of Skywalker. I mean, there's some weird moments in The Rise of Skywalker. Kind of out of left field. The the duel in the desert, which I love, between Rey running with her lightsaber and Kylo Ren um, in his uh, Thai whisper um, is really kind of bizarre. And, you know, a, a little... I don't want to say not abstract's not the right word, but in terms of why... <laughs> It's 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 odd, but I love it. I love that scene from beginning to end. It's a very unique and different, a different style of storytelling and action than, in my opinion, we had seen in other in other films. I almost liken it to the Force Cave from The Empire Strikes Back at a young age, and not fully understanding what was going on <laughs> in The Rise of Skywalker. Just, but the. Um, the visual storytelling of that of that portion of the film I really love. And to me, it's what makes it sort of a close kin to and a mashup of the of the last uh, of the last Jedi. I was also reminded, though, of just how much negativity comes around Star Wars. And while it feels like it's the majority of the fandom, it really isn't. As somebody who's been doing radio for 28 years uh, I have my own detractors. I have friends of the show, and then I have who I call foes of the show. And foes listen as much, if not more, to the show than the friends do. They just hate me. But they don't represent the majority of the fans out there. But they're the ones that end up gaining the most attention. And it's really unfortunate that so much negativity uh, ends up following these films. I understand why. It's not justified. I understand why, because the fandom... Uh, you know, has a personal connection to these films and takes these things very seriously and personally. And that certainly was the case in the uh, commentary around uh, The Last Jedi, but really enjoyed watching it. Uh, the way that it plays out is weird. It almost is two films. If you stop the film at the end of the burning of the the, the Jedi Temple, if you will, that has the books in it, when Yoda shows up, you could actually break it up into two like hour and a half films almost. That's usually where the stopping point is if I'm only if I'm watching it into into sittings. But love that film. The end of the Last Jedi is actually the end. The, the book ended wise, my favorite beginning and end to a, to a Star Wars film. The opening battle is fantastic, and that end battle on crate is absolutely uh, amazing. But hey, you know what? That's just how I feel about it. This is not going to go the way you think. All right, after my rambling about The Last Jedi, let's go here. Again, not a lot of story news to share with you. However, some actors and actresses of Star Wars and modern Star Wars are speaking out about some of the difficulties that they've had making these films. From Fox News, Daisy Ridley had severe anxiety while filming Star Wars movies as she dealt with the fame that comes with the franchise. Taking on the role of Rey changed the actress's life 10 years ago, Ridley recently told Inverse. 
31 years old now. She recalled J.J. Abrams telling her, understand the scale. This is not a role in a movie. This is a religion for people, and it changes things on a level that is that is inconceivable. When all of the craziness was going on, I was like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm coping, fine, everything's fine. And I was fine for the most part, she told the outlet. But I think what I was really grappling with was this was that this was my normal, but it was not normal to other people. Due to the fame that followed in her role, Ridley her began isolating herself. For friends and family or any people who see something slightly different in, uh, in a different way than you do, there's this projection of you and you in that world and how it feels to do this and that, Ridley said. And you're like, well, I'm actually I'm just a human being. Separate from that, it's quite this wrestle of reality and the fantasy that's often projected onto you. Riz, uh, Ridley developed holes in her stomach wall due to severe anxiety that she was experiencing at the time. The Last Jedi premiered in 2017. She took a, a six-month sabbatical before jumping into filming for The Rise of Skywalker. The actress first spoke about her health issue in a 2020 interview with GQ. I saw a picture of me at the London premiere for The Last Jedi, and I was so skinny, and my skin was terrible, she revealed. My body was just effed up. I got tests done, and it turned out my body was taking in no nutrients. I was just like a little skeleton, and I was just so tired. I was becoming a ghost. The Rise of Skywalker premiered in 2019. The coronavirus pandemic shut the world down three months later, giving Ridley an opportunity to overcome her anxiety. After the last Star Wars came out and everything was quiet, I was like, what the blank was I, uh, what the blank I was grieving, she told Inverse. Having to sit down and still be in lockdown was an incredibly helpful way that I hadn't anticipated, she added. And I realized there was a lot that I hadn't processed properly. Boy, um, you know, it's all relative, but <laughs> it never should be that way. And I know that is nothing new for somebody who decided to be an actor or an actress. But, I mean, really, I mean, come on. I love my Star Wars. I've done hundreds of podcasts already, and I can tell you shouldn't be taken that seriously. Ewan McGregor talked to Variety magazine about making panned Star Wars, saying this. Ewan McGregor was very reluctant to play Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, he admitted. It wasn't a done deal for me. I didn't think it was at all who I was. I believed at that point I was a Danny Boyle actor, of course, from Train Spotting. The beach was more important, and I meant it. It wasn't flippant. I didn't ask a lot of people for advice. I'm happy that I am this character for a lot of people. But when these films came out, they were so disliked. That was hard. The first one was panned, and we still had to make another two. It was weird to be in a film that was hammered. He enjoyed making Obi-Wan Kenobi, though. I would love to do a second season. There is no talk of that yet. There's a lot going on at Disney. It's interesting the way the fandom works. And how views and opinions change because the views and opinions of the prequels have shifted so many different times since their release. I understand why people dislike them when they were released. I get it. Um, that you, I, I would almost argue there was nothing that George Lucas could have put out there that would have met the expectations of what we as fans had. Now, I enjoyed it, right? Um, and I was a bit of apolog an apologist, and I am a little bit now, I guess, in terms of Star Wars, um, although I've been more critical over the course of the past, you know, 10 years or so. Uh, but I enjoyed the, the prequel trilogy. It was new Star Wars. And I just loved science fiction and ended up loving space opera in, in all of its different forms. And Star Wars still did it better than anybody else did. But that was also the start of, you know, the Internet and being able to share those opinions and, you know, shotgun them everywhere. Not quite as bad. Let me, let me rephrase that. Not nearly as bad. Not even close to being as bad as it is now. Um, but back then, that was the beginning of that. Unfortunately, The Phantom Menace took the brunt of that. It's funny, though, because when Attack of the Clones came out, that was, generally speaking, more well-received, saying, okay, this is a step up. Less Jar Jar, more action. You know, all right, this is cool. But now you talk to people and suddenly Attack of the Clones is their least favorite Star Wars film of all time, which I just simply do not get at all. All right, 
We have one listener feedback this week. It's been slow in the Star Wars universe. I completely understand. I need someone to show me my place in all this. Now, this was in response to what has arguably been uh, the most popular of my podcasts. And if you happen to be listening to this one for the first time, you should go and check it out. It's called Raylo's, um, the uh, Raylo, the greatest love story Star Wars ever told. Uh, Viewer Online 101 writes, a very good analysis. I agree with most of it. There's just one thing where I feel like you're off. It's when she stabs Kylo. You said she has a moment of clarity that she realizes that she can do both, destroy Palpatine and bring Ben back. However, her running away to hide herself on the same planet Luke did, saying that she was going to give up until Luke convinces her to go back, contradicts this. That is a very good point. And I will admit that that is a contradiction. What I think happened is that when she felt uh, Leia reach Ben, she sensed that Ben was still there inside Kylo and she couldn't bring herself to kill him or let him die as long as that part of him endured. And even if he was a lost cause in her eyes and her healing him afterwards cemented this belief in her. This is why she thought she was going to fail and runs away. Yeah, I would tend to agree. And thanks for pointing out that contradiction in my analysis of uh, Raylo through the uh, sequel trilogy. Again, you can email me talkshownerd at gmail.com or leave a comment up on YouTube like they did. So, if you are a uh, if you are a frequent listener to the show, I will bid you adieu. Thank you so much uh, for listening. As always, I hope to hear from you. Drop me an email, talkshownerd at gmail dot com. Slow, um, you know, slow time in the Star Wars universe, but I'd love to get your thoughts on anything relating to Star Wars, for that matter. If you are a newer listener to the show and you like to read, I hope you'll check out my science fiction uh, book series. Seven books in all in the series. It's called Embark. Uh, book one is as follows. Taft has found something and humanity won't survive without it. With interstellar travel possible, ship mechanic Taft Guardia prepared to one day travel the galaxy. But when an industrial accident inside a D-Corp civilian and military spacecraft factory sets up an apocalyptic sets off an apocalyptic chain of events, exploring the stars becomes a matter of survival. As the global evacuation begins, the ruthless Sint Argum of D-Corp threatens to destroy every vessel not loyal to his regime. In the meantime, fellow pilot Kate Amaro suddenly receives a cryptic message from her father, an aerospace engineer who died one year earlier. <gasps> when Taft and Katha discover what may be the key to saving Earth's evacuees, they become unwittingly tied to the catastrophe and must solve the mystery of her father's past before it's too late. <gasps> Listen, if you uh, like to listen to audiobooks or you like to read science fiction, I hope that you'll check out my fast-paced and action-packed um, epic space opera adventure series. Treat yourself, a friend, or a family member with sci-fi. Written for adults, it is great for ages 11 plus in terms of content. Nothing explicit, language, or otherwise. Think Star Wars in terms of violence. Pick up Embark Book 1 today. Uh, you can get the ebook right now for just 99 cents. You can get the box set of the entire series in ebook at a discounted price as well, available on, Am- on Amazon.com. The entire series is available on ebook, Kindle Unlimited, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook uh, produced uh, and uh, narrated by me. You can also purchase your paperbacks and hardcovers directly from me if you're interested of any of the seven books in the series. It tells a complete story. The series breaks down to the opening trilogy, which tells a complete story, a connection book in Gon Corbin and the Asteroid of Misfortune, which continues to tell the story but can be read as its own single adventure, and then the second series of books five, six, and seven. You can read them as a whole. You can read them as two separate trilogies. You can read Embark Book 1 alone, and you can read Gon Corbin and the Asteroid of Misfortune alone. Um, I would encourage you to buy all seven of the books, to be honest with you. If you like your science fiction space opera epic filled with some romance and action and amazing technology, because I'm into spaceships, Embark is perfect for you. Again, on Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. Um, I will talk to you again next week. In the meantime, I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope wherever you are, you're happy, you're healthy, and you're safe. We'll talk to you then. Bye. The Force will be with you. Always. My nerd road.